Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on the Pax Romana. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to talk about the period of Roman peace that comes into play after Augustus is able to put an end to the civil wars. We'll start today by talking about the wacky Julio-Claudians, so the emperors that follow Augustus. From there, we're going to talk a little bit about the Roman Empire, and we're going to do so through the lens of architecture, through the monuments these emperors have left behind, which will give you a sense for the things that they've done kind of historically, but also kind of give you a nice little travel itinerary for when you yourself make it over to Rome. So let's go ahead and start by setting the scene. It begins, of course, way before the city of Rome was ever founded, and during that time, Italy was comprised of a series of different tribes, the most successful and powerful of which were the Etruscans. The city of Rome was founded in 753 BC, and for the next 250 years it was ruled by a series of seven kings. And while the first guys, Romulus and Numa Pompilius, start out as really good dudes, the last guy, Tarquin the Proud, was very much not so. And as a result, we get a rebellion against those kings, led by Lucius Junius Brutus in 509 BC. He ejects Tarquin the Proud from the city of Rome and starts the Roman Republic. And the guiding ideology of that Roman Republic is there will never be a king in Rome. No longer will we have a single person ruling. Even at the highest levels of government, you'll always have two people, two consuls, and they're only rule for a year. Now, even though that's the case for 500 years, they end up with this problem at the very, very end where Rome's embroiled in this series of civil wars, three different civil wars, and it's a bloody mess. And the problem is that people are trying to compete for prestige, and they're using their armies to do so. And it's Octavian, who later gets the title of Augustus, who comes out victorious in that final set of civil wars and is able to bring the Roman world to a time of peace. So during the civil wars, right, uh, the, the kind of third set of civil wars between Octavian and Antony, after they defeat the senators at Philippi, the Roman world gets broken up like this. So Octavian gets control of the West, Spain and Gaul and Italy. Antony has control of the East, Macedonia and Greece, Asia and Egypt. And Lepidus, poor Lepidus, nobody cares about Lepidus, he gets control of North Africa. But by the death of Octavian, who we're now calling Augustus because that title was bestowed upon him by the Senate, the revered one, right? Uh, this is what the Roman world ends up looking like. And what you're going to notice here is that by the death of Augustus, Rome's first emperor, the empire is basically built, all right? So the areas in red are what Rome controls, and the areas kind of in this cream color here, that's what Rome is at its greatest extent. So Rome's basically already there. So let's take a look at these wacky Julio-Claudians, the successors to Augustus. So Augustus dies in 14 CE, right? And he's proclaimed uh, the Augustus in 27 BC, which means he's ruled for about 41 years. And this length of rule cannot be underestimated. A huge reason why this transition from Republic to Empire is successful is because the dude just lives a long time, all right? By the time he dies, there aren't that many people around who remember what the Republic used to be. And those people who are around that still remember it probably remember it as a time of civil war. Now, one of the problems with living that long is he keeps outliving all of his heirs, right? The different people that he would want to be emperor after him, they keep dying because he, he lives for so long. And so eventually, he doesn't have a male son to turn the empire over to, so he adopts his grandnephew and he gives the empire to him. And that guy's name is Tiberius. And young Tiberius here, well, he doesn't really want to be emperor, okay? Uh, and he doesn't kind of like things that people like. So he hates the gladiatorial games, right? He thinks they're dumb. He neglects public works, so the things kind of being built in the city of Rome, he doesn't restore them or anything. He's kind of really harsh judici judicially, right? And every day there are kind of executions. And so we can see from the very beginning that the kind of public face of Tiberius is not really great. And in private, it's even worse, right? So he gets very, very paranoid, and he moves out to the island of Capri, where he builds this villa, all right? And you can still go visit that, uh, that villa today. And plus, just being on the island of Capri is an awesome experience. I highly recommend going. 
But he's there for like the second half of his reign, for like a decade. He's on this island, and he's a heavy drinker. Um, he gets really weird kind of sexually with little kids. He calls these little kids his minnows, and he has them like swim around, and then he does weird things to them. He's not a good dude, all right? In addition to that, he's still executing people. He likes to push them off this cliff. You can't really see it here, but it's a several hundred foot drop down into the water from there. And this whole kind of time is just crazy paranoid that people are trying to kill him. And on top of that, the crazy guy is afraid of thunder and afraid of fish. Pretty weird dude. Let's take a look at what's happening around the empire while Tiberius is being this totally crazy emperor, right? Well, what we're looking at, the red is kind of the borders of the empire at the end of Tiberius. And so even though he ruled for 23 years, and even though he was a crazy dude, nothing really changes, all right? So even though personally he's kind of a train wreck, in terms of the empire at large, nothing's really changing. The takeaway point seems to be, as long as you're not taking these armies and trying to start civil wars with them, things are gonna be okay. Now, one of the other things that happens during the reign of Tiberius is we get the crucifixion of a young man way out in Judea, right? A guy by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He was born during the reign of Augustus, and he's crucified somewhere around the age of 33, um, around 30 CE, uh, out in Judea under the reign of Tiberius. So this kind of thing, right? Christianity is one of the large legacies of the ancient Roman world, and uh, Jesus himself um, is born right under the first emperor and dies under the second emperor. So people must have been pretty happy when they got rid of Tiberius. And they're especially happy because the next emperor, Caligula, he's awesome, all right? So the, the name Caligula is actually a nickname, all right? And it very literally translates as little boots because as a little kid, he used to wear these like army boots around um, and follow the army, all right? And he like loves the gladiatorial games, right? He's throwing banquets for the people. Uh, he's like reviving all these public works. At the beginning of his reign, Caligula is like a, a great dude. Everybody loves him, all right? And what you're probably thinking is like, I thought Caligula was a monster. Well, you're absolutely right. He is a monster, all right? So he changes at some point in time during this reign, and he starts getting real weird with it, all right? So first thing he does is he goes ahead and he starts chopping off the heads of the statues of the gods, right? So statue of Jupiter, chop his head off, and he puts a uh, like a, a sculpture of his own head on top of that statue. He ends up doing this weird thing where he dresses up like a common person for what he calls these nightly activities. And he goes around to brothels and bars and gets really drunk and starts fights and has his way with women of the night. He ends up declaring himself a living god, right? So we're only a couple emperors, right? We're only two emperors removed from Augustus who very kind of uh, prudently said, I am not a god. And now this guy's chopping off the heads of gods and declaring himself a god. Uh, he's making out with his sister, which is pretty weird. Uh, he's killing his other relatives, which is also not so great. Um, and perhaps most famously, our guy Caligula is, tries to name his horse, right? His favorite horse, Incitatus. He tries to make him a senator, right? He tries to make him consul. And uh, so Caligula, again, really weird dude. And so with the death of Caligula, we see the rise of Claudius. Now, Claudius wants nothing to do with being emperor. And actually, with the death of Caligula, he's found hiding in a closet. So he's really, really scared that the Praetorian Guard, the same guys who killed Caligula, are going to kill him as well for kind of being part of the royal family. But the Praetorian Guard shows up, and they pull back the curtain, and they see little Claudius hiding there, shivering, right? And instead of killing them, they're like, okay, you're the new emperor, all right? Now, Claudius doesn't want anything to do with this. Uh, he's kind of a weird dude. He stutter, st stutters real bad, right? And he's got like kind of a, a, um, a bad leg, so he's got kind of this leg that he's dragging around everywhere. And really what he wants to do is he wants to be a historian. And he's actually a pretty good one. We don't have his work still, but it was said that he wrote like a 42-volume history during his time. Now, so he's kind of this weird dude, but he's not as evil as Caligula is in the end. He's not as weird as Tiberius is. And even though he doesn't want to be emperor, again, he's not doing anything destructive. Now, one of the worst things for poor Claudius here is his love life. 
And he has three different wives kind of throughout his rule, going from before his reign as emperor to his death. And his first wife, well, she ends up cheating on him, right? So you're the emperor and your wife's still cheating on you. And this is so bad that everybody knows it, right? It's not like it happened one time, like kind of inconspicuously. Everybody knows he's being cheated on. So he's got to get rid of her. Then he has another wife. And this second wife, some scholars say, basically was emotionally and mentally abusive to him. All right? And then the third wife, all right, the one depicted here, Messalina, well, not only does she cheat all over the place with him, it was actually rumored that while she was married to Claudius, she had a competition with a prostitute to see who could sleep with the most people in a single day. And then she ends up poisoning poor Claudius to death. So Claudius is like, he doesn't have this kind of blessed life, all right? Uh, but nonetheless, he's actually a pretty good emperor for Rome. It's under Claudius that Rome's actually able to annex the island of Britain. And so we saw Julius Caesar be the first to cross the English Channel and win some victories over the British tribes there. But it's Claudius who's able to kind of make the lasting impact, send over a group of people, have them establish some colonies there, and basically bring Britain south of uh, what we eventually be Hadrian's Wall into the Roman world. So in the end, right, it's Claudius's wife, Messalina, who ends up poisoning him with mushrooms. And so, uh, again, if you ever think you're unlucky in love, just remember poor old Claudius with his wife cheating on him and abusing him and then eventually killing him. And, uh, well, just be glad you're not that guy. So next up, we have the emperor Nero. And it's actually his mom who ends up killing Claudius. And she did that, so her son, this guy right here with the awesome neck beard, uh, ends up getting to be emperor. So it turns out at the beginning that they have a really weird relationship, all right? And eventually Nero ends up killing his own mom. And Nero has quite a few kind of, let's call them issues, all right? So he loves the gladiatorial games, but he's making senators fight in them, all right? So the Senate now has become a complete joke. Think back to Augustus and how much he kind of, at least publicly, respected the Senate. Nero's not really doing that sort of thing. In addition, one of the things that Nero does is he like dresses up and he sneaks out at night, all right? And so what he does, is he puts on this cloak so nobody can realize who he is, and he goes and hides in the bushes at night. And when a regular person comes by, he like jumps out of the bushes and then beats them with a stick and like steals their money. Now this is the Emperor of Rome doing this, right? And if the guy tries to fight back, then the Praetorian Guard comes out and kills the guy trying to fight back. <laughs> on top of that, this guy's like raping Vestal Virgins, right? They're supposed to be the ones, right, who are chaste and pure, and Nero's just having his way with them. So, in addition to this, uh, Nero is a huge fan of Greek theater. Really what he wants to be, not a historian like Claudius, he wants to be an actor, right, and a singer. And so the, the kind of legend is, there's a huge fire that breaks out in 64 CE. And Nero is said to have fiddled, right, fiddled and sang while Rome burned to the ground. Now, one of the things that people think is that it might have actually been Nero who started this fire. And the thinking behind this is that after the fire burns a huge swath of the city, what Nero does is he takes some of the best land there and he builds an enormous mansion, a recreation of which you're looking at here. Now, this is called the Domus Aria, or the Golden House. It's got like a huge lake built in there. It's got this dining room that was like a rotating dining room so you could see the different constellations at different point in time. And then there's this giant statue, this giant gilded statue of Nero himself. And it was a colossal statue, right? That's why they call it the Colossus. So uh, Nero builds this house right where the fire was. And that's what makes people think maybe Nero actually had a hand in, in starting the fire to begin with. So. Let's go ahead and we're going to move on from the Julio-Claudian emperors, right? So what we saw with those guys is that Augustus starts out as this really great, um, prudent emperor. And then the next four guys are insane, right? They're all insane. And the thing is, it doesn't really matter. The empire at large doesn't change very much. As long as you're not starting civil wars, as long as you're not using Roman armies to fight other Romans, things are basically okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to take kind of a, a stroll through the next uh, 150 years of emperors. And rather than focus on exactly which battles they fought, 
we're going to focus on a few of the major monuments that arose during this period. And that kind of gives us an insight to what's going on in the empire. And the reason for this is things don't change a lot at the kind of edges. So again, at the death of Augustus, right, the very first emperor, most of the Roman Empire is already under Roman control. Now they're always fighting at the edges, and kind of 100 and 110 years later, uh, what we end up seeing is Rome at its kind of peak under the Emperor Trajan, but overall, things don't change very much, right? So we go from something that looks like this under Augustus to something that looks like this under Trajan. It's fairly similar. So let's take a look through these kind of emperors now. So we're going to start by talking about the most famous monument in all of Rome. And that's located right down here, right to the east of the Palatine Hill. And that, of course, is the Colosseum. Now, if you're looking at this name, you're like, well, that doesn't say Colosseum. It says Flavian Amphitheater. That's what people kind of called this originally in the ancient world. The reason it gets the, the name Colosseum is that this was actually a nickname. And so it was a statue of Nero that ends up standing outside of this thing, the colossal statue, and that's why we call it the Colosseum. Now, this was built by Vespasian and Titus, started in 78 uh, CE, ended in 80 CE by those two emperors, and this is basically on the grounds of where the Domus Aria used to be. So one of the things that they do is they knock down Nero's golden house after the death of Nero. Nero actually commits suicide because he knows he's going to be killed. And they build this thing for the people on top of it. And then they take that statue and they basically change it a little bit so it's no longer a statue of Nero, um, but rather of the gods. And therefore, it's allowed to stand and that gives the nickname to the Colosseum. Next up, we are going to travel just a little bit to the north and a little bit to the west. And we're going to look at one of the famous triumphal arches. This is the Arch of Titus, okay? So the Colosseum was finished in 80 CE. In 81 CE, this triumphal arch is put up. And what a triumphal arch is, is when you get back from war, you set up one of these things and it commemorates your victories. And for Titus, this was commemorating the victory over the Jewish people. And one of the cool kind of things is when you look on the inside of the arch and you have this relief of the kind of victory march out of this area, you can actually see them taking the loot from the second temple of Jerusalem. And so here, of course, you can see the kind of monumental menorah being carried out of the temple by Roman troops. So next up, we are going to head to the area of Rome called the Campus Martius. All right, so this is the Tiber River right here. We have the bend in the Tiber, and this is the Campus Martius. This is where Roman troops in the earliest days used to go through their training exercises. And as Rome grew, right, that was no longer suitable for, for troops training because the city expands to that area. And in particular, about 15 years after the Arch of Titus, we see the next emperor, Domitian, put up a stadium. Now here's useful to differentiate between these different types of architecture, right? So a stadium is used for kind of athletic events, running races. This is different from a circus, where a circus would be rounded on both sides, it would be much bigger, and that would be used for chariot racing. Those are both different than a theater, and that's used for theatrical performances. And those are different than an amphitheater, which is used for gladiatorial games. So this is built in, uh, in the Campus Martius for athletic events by Domitian. Now today, the Stadium of Domitian is one of the most popular places in modern Rome. And we call that, of course, Piazza Navona. And a piazza is like this giant kind of open area where people can gather and there are restaurants and cafes and things like that. And uh, if you go to Rome today, you have to stop by Piazza Navona. One of the cool kind of things is it's built literally right on top of the stadium. And so we can still see one end in the architecture. One end of the buildings is still curved, while the other end ends up being flat. Next up, we're going to move a little bit eastward. And we're going to take a look at one of these kind of memorializing columns, what we call a triumphal column. And much like the triumphal arch of Titus, this is put up in commemoration of one of the Roman emperor's victories. And in this case, we're looking at the emperor Trajan, right? It's under Trajan that Rome reaches its greatest extent. And what Trajan is commemorating is his victory over the Dacians, right? So think if you go kind of northeast from Italy and then a little bit further east, that's Dacia, all right? 
And one of the cool kind of things is that uh, it's hard to kind of see exactly what's on there because the, t the column's so tall. But one of the museums that was actually set up by Mussolini in the early 20th century ends up uh, making a cast of the entire triumphal column and then putting it all at eye level. So you can go to this museum, the Museum of Roman Civilization. One of the cool things is that there's nothing original in the whole museum. It's all models and casts of things from all over the Roman Empire. It was Mussolini's goal to kind of show off the glory of not just the city of Rome or the, the kind of country of Italy, but the entire empire. And you can walk through and look at all the iconography on here. And we can see some of the cool kind of battle formations, right? It actually it kind of tells us a little bit about um, what formations Romans used in warfare. And here we're looking at the famous testudo formation, which translates as the tortoise, right? And you would use this where everybody links shields both in front and up top, and that prevents them from arrows coming down as they besiege a city. Now, next up, we are gonna move west to uh, my favorite monument in all of ancient Rome, and that is the Pantheon, right? This is the coolest thing. So this was uh, actually started way back 100 years before this time right here, but it kept burning down. And so what we're looking at is this form uh, from the early 2nd century AD, and it was built under the emperor Hadrian. Now Hadrian was a pretty good dude. So what he does is when he builds this thing, even though he built it, he goes ahead and puts up the original inscription. So originally this was constructed by Marcus Agrippa. And here's your kind of epigraphy, your Latin epigraphy lesson for the day. We can see uh, Marcus Agrippa, so the M is for Marcus Agrippa, and then it's son, that's the F, Philius, of Lucius, all right, that's what the L is. And then he made this in his third consulship, consul tertium, right? So Marcus Agrippa, son of Lucius, made this in his third consulship, um, and Hadrian puts up that original description, even though it was 100 years after the, uh, the thing was originally built. Now, the Pantheon literally means the temple for all the gods. And this has got a really unique kind of crazy um, architectural form here. So on the front, it looks pretty normal, right? Triangular kind of roof, columns in the front, um, that sort of thing. And then you look at the back and it's totally wacky, all right? So we've got this kind of giant cylinder, like cylinder rising out um, and it's made of brick and it goes to this kind of domed roof. And that domed roof for 1500 years is the largest dome in the world. And we can see the oculus in the center. So there's actually an open space in the roof. And that's really important structurally because it relieves some of the weight. So the weight gets distributed down on all sides and it makes it a lot lighter, all right? And so when it rains, it just kind of comes down through the, the roof, drains into the floor. And until the Duomo in Florence, and then later uh, St. Peter's in, in Rome, this was the largest dome in the world. The walls were actually, these walls here, they're actually like 30 feet thick uh, to be able to support the weight of the dome. So next up, we're moving across the Tiber River, north and west, towards where modern-day St. Peter's Basilica is. And we're going to look at the mausoleum of Hadrian. So Hadrian was the guy who built that current form of the Pantheon, and now we're taking a look at his tomb. Now, if you're like, well, that doesn't look like a Roman tomb at all, that's because the popes, right, in the centuries following ancient Rome, end up co-opting this place and making it a papal fortress that we now call Castel Sant uh, Castel Sant'Angelo. But if you look at its kind of core form, right, this kind of cylindrical form, this is actually very, very similar to the mausoleum of Augustus that we saw kind of across the river um, also in Rome. So next up, we're moving on to the Capitoline Hill, right? So Hadrian is in the first half of the second century AD, and now we're moving on to the Capitoline Hill, and we're going to look at the philosopher emperor Marcus Aurelius. And on the Capitoline, uh, right in between the Capitoline Museums, which are actually designed by Michelangelo, we get this equestrian statue of one of the Roman emperors. Now, this is a bronze statue, and one of the things about bronze statues in the ancient world is they hardly ever survive. And that's because bronze is really valuable and useful, and you can take something like that, and if you're not a Roman dude, it doesn't mean anything to you, and so you melt it down, right? And you use the bronze for something else. But what ends up happening is after the fall of Rome, people actually think that this is a statue of Constantine, the first Christian emperor. 
And so they don't want to desecrate a statue of the Christian emperor, so they leave it up, and it's not till like 2,000 years later that they realize this is actually a statue of Marcus Aurelius, which they can tell by the kind of details in the face. So we get this equestrian statue on the Capitoline Hill. Now, Marcus Aurelius, as depicted here in the movie Gladiator, he's off fighting Germans, right? So we saw Trajan fighting the Dacians. We see Marcus Aurelius uh, fighting the Germans. We still see fighting at the very edges of empire, but it just doesn't have much of a lasting impact. Maybe they gain a little area, maybe they lose a little area, but the core of the Roman Empire stays more or less the same. Marcus Aurelius is also who we call the philosopher emperor. And that's because he writes this kind of book here uh, on his philosophies of life, and he calls those the meditations. Now, Marcus Aurelius dies in 180 CE. And so we've seen from the start of Augustus in 27 BC to the death of Marcus Aurelius in 180 CE, 207, uh, 207 years of relatively peaceful uh, time within the Mediterranean. Rome rules basically the entire Mediterranean during just about the entire period, and things are relatively peaceful internally. Sure, they're still fighting on, on the kind of outskirts of things, but internally things are good. And one of the things that I kind of like from Marcus Aurelius' meditations here uh, is this kind of quote that he has about the gods. And we'll see that even the emperors, right, question their kind of existence. And so Marcus Aurelius says, live a good life. If there are gods and they are just, then they will not care how devout you have been, but will welcome you based on the virtues you have lived by. If there are gods but they're unjust, then you shouldn't want to worship them anyway. And if there are no gods, then you will be gone, but you will have lived a noble life that will live on in the memories of your loved ones. So kind of, so no matter how things work out theologically, right, live a good life and it's going to be better for you and your loved ones. So, a few concluding thoughts, right? Uh, during the early period, right after Augustus, immediately, starting with Tiberius and then Caligula and Claudius and Nero, we get some crazy emperors, right? Personally, these guys are messed up. Caligula is trying to make his horse a consul, all right? And it just doesn't have a very big impact. And then over the next 150 years, we get pretty good dudes ruling in Rome. And they start fighting around the edges, but internally, there's cohesion, right? Internally, they're not using Roman armies to fight other Romans, and therefore, it's a period of relative peace. And that's why we call this period the Pax Romana.